down to Acapulco. I know I'm headed down to Acapulco oh, with the low white sands where I might have a chance. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Gonna head down to Acapulco. yeah, I like these portable microphones. Usually when I speak to a group, if there's a mic, it's one of those that's attached to the podium. And I'm six foot six and the mic is always too low. So I'm always having to lean over. Can you hear me? It's good to be speaking to a group of anarchists. Uh, I do public speaking quite a bit. I'm a university professor, so I talk to students all the time, obviously. And uh, I, I write and speak a lot about topics like uh, political correctness and stuff that's related to that. So a lot of times when I'm doing public presentations, I'm speaking to a right wing, very far right wing audience, because they're the ones that really uh, imbibe that and you know the left isn't quite as interesting so a lot of times I'm speaking to a more conservative audience and it's all these stuffy people in a suit and tie and all this kind of stuff and they're saying Keith you know we like what you say about all this PC stuff but this anarchism thing is crazy but, uh, so it's good to be among folks who get it uh, I titled my presentation Anarchist Victory in the 21st Century and uh, everything I'm going to say today is mostly ad lib. I wasn't a scheduled speaker here. Um, I got in the other night and I ran into Jeff at the bar and he's like, why did you tell me you were coming down? I would have put you on the speaker's roster and I'm like, well, okay, if somebody doesn't show up or something, I guess I can say a few words. So apparently someone's not available, so here I am. Um, but anarchist victory in the 21st century, I like those two words in the same sentence, uh, anarchism and victory. Um, but if we look at the history of politics and we look at the history of civilization, what we really see is the history of oppression. That's really been the history of mankind uh, to date, is the history of oppression. Every system, every society, every civilization that's really existed to date has been organized on the basis of oppression. Uh, now that's not to say that people have never done anything else, that we haven't created great works of art or science or philosophy or architecture or music or medicine or anything like that. But along with that has been an awful lot of oppression. And if we look at all of the people who have ever lived, all of the human beings who've ever lived on this planet, for most of these people, life was nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, keep in mind that even at the uh, height of the Roman Empire, when the Roman civilization was at its apex, the life expectancy was maybe 48 years, if you were lucky. Uh, in India, 100 years ago, the average life expectancy was 22 years. So for most people that have ever lived, uh, life has not been kind. Um, but at the same time, there's still reason for optimism because we see over time, we see a lot of progress being made. Um, as far as the history of politics is concerned, throughout history, the norm has been that the individual has been considered the property of the state, the property of their rulers. And it was like that in all of the ancient civilizations. It was like that in the medieval world. Uh, and in many parts of the world today, it's still like that. Uh, there have been exceptions in ancient Greece. They were really the first civilization to come up with the idea that maybe citizens have rights against the state, kind of, sort of. They were a bit ambiguous about that at times, uh, but they did set a precedent that sort of paved the way for some uh, social evolution later on. Um, and then uh, some of these ideas that were first established by the Greeks were reintroduced into Western civilization during the Renaissance, during the Age of the Enlightenment. And out of that came some of these classical liberal constitutions from the 18th and 19th century. Uh, some of that was being discussed in a presentation a couple days ago. But the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, all of these kinds of things. You know, and the core theme behind all these documents is that people have rights that can't be abrogated by the state, by those in authority for any reason. You know, that the people at the top of the pyramid can't just take a shit on you for any reason they want. That's really the theory behind that. And however incomplete it may be, uh, you know, it's, it's somewhere. It, 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 it's something. It's, a, it's an improvement. Um, but what's interesting, though, is to look at the last couple of centuries. And what we see is that in the 18th century and in the 19th century, the the fundamental basis that was used in prior civilizations to legitimize the state started to decline. In traditional societies, religion and the state were heavily intertwined. In the ancient world, they, they worshiped the emperor as a god. They believed he came down from the sun and the sun god sat him on his throne or something like that. 
uh, when the monotheistic religions evolved, the uh, Christianity and, and Islam and Judaism, they sort of changed that. They said, no, the emperor is not, or the king or whomever is not really a god. Uh, instead, he's just appointed by God. He's a divine, uh, the divine right of kings and all that. Uh, but after the scientific revolution, after the age of enlightenment, these kinds of ideas became less and less credible. Uh, so what was interesting is that ruling classes had to reinvent themselves. They had to come up with new means of legitimizing themselves. So what they did was instead of having uh, a system where religion and the state were intertwined, they simply created cults of the state. And they legitimized these with ideology. Um, there were, uh, the 19th century philosopher Frederick Nietzsche was one of the first people to notice this. He noticed in the 19th century that as the old traditional feudal societies with their theocratic um, systems of government, their state churches, their coronation ceremonies, their monarchs and aristocrats were breaking down, he noticed that ideological movements were coming along to replace these and that states were picking up on this and using these new ideological movements as a means of self-legitimation. And Nietzsche predicted that in the 21st century, he's speaking in the late 19th century now, but he predicted in the 20th century there would be great wars between ideological movements that were comparable to the religious wars of the 17th century. The 17th century we saw some really bloody, nasty wars uh, in Europe and other places between Protestants and Catholics and different sects of Protestants and Catholics and Christians and Muslims. You know, that was the norm. That's how they did things back then. Um, and in the 20th century, we did see what Nietzsche predicted. We saw uh, these state systems emerge that had unprecedented levels of power. Uh, the ancient emperors, the pharaohs, the Caesars, and all of that, they would have been very envious of modern totalitarian states and the kind of power and the kind of control that those kinds of states have had. Uh, you know, someone like Julius Caesar or Marcus Aurelius or the Ramses II, they would have looked at Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong and said, wow, they've got it made. You know, if only I could, could have had that. Right? So that's what we saw in the 20th century. The, the 20th century was really the age of statism. It was a time that these massive totalitarian states emerged, that uh, these um, dictators, these guys that were you know, secular gods in a way, you know, the, and all of these kinds of states had this. They, they, they deified the head of state just like they did the, uh, the emperor uh, in the ancient world. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is the impact that that has had and what I think the legacy is, of that is going to be. The legacy of the wars of religion and the religious persecution that existed in the Middle Ages, in the early modern period, uh, the Thirty Years' War, all of these kinds of things, part of the legacy of that was to essentially delegitimize religious institutions. And that's what happened during the Age of Enlightenment. You had thinkers like John Locke, like Voltaire, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, like the Baron de Montesquieu, uh, like Thomas Jefferson, many others who came along and said, look at the history of what religious institutions have done. You know, we shouldn't have these religious institutions anywhere near the state. Let's have separation of church and state. And let's start thinking of more secular ways of organizing society. Uh, what has happened since then is that the state, the religion of the state has replaced the religion of the church in a way, and modern political ideologies have become the legitimating basis of the state. But what we're starting to see now in the early 21st century is that states are incre increasingly starting to lose their legitimacy. If we think about it, no serious thinking person anywhere in any modern society really takes seriously ideas like fascism, Nazism, communism, an absolute monarchy, a hereditary aristocracy, a military dictatorship. You probably couldn't find one in 10,000 people on the street of, say, New York City who would seriously believe in theories of, of the state like that. I mean, yeah, there are fringe groups and cults and all of that, sure. But most people do not take that seriously. Certainly most educated people do not. Instead, all that we have left is this religion of mass democracy. That is considered to be the legitimating religious foundation, if you will, for modern states. 
Um, and that's why I'm very happy to hear people uh, at this conference who have been criticizing mass democracy, because I think that's the real enemy in the 21st century, this idea that we have these uh, idiotic elections, these coronation ceremonies where you go in a booth and pick, okay, lever A, lever B, well, I push lever A, so this guy's in entitled to tell me, you know, to dump on me all he wants to, right? Um, and, and this is all legitimate simply because this is democracy and the people have spoken and you know, so charlatan A won over charlatan B or whatever. Um, it's very important to delegitimize this system of mass democracy because that's really the intellectual and cultural and moral foundation of modern states. If that goes, the state is done. And I think that's increasingly starting to happen. In countries where mass democracy is the norm, the state is increasingly breaking down. It's increasingly uh, becoming disreputable. In the United States, where many of us are from, um, polls will show that every institution has a negative approval rating. I think the US Congress has a consistent 8% approval rating or something like that. Nobody really believes in this system anymore. Nobody really takes it seriously. And when we look at other parts of the world where mass democracy has been introduced, we see it's produced awful results. Egypt was a good example. Um, so increasingly, we're seeing, going to see the state breaking down just through a loss of legitimacy. And we're going to start to see uh, alternatives to the state, to these massive bureaucratic uh, coercive entities uh, emerge. And we're already starting to see that. We're starting to see all over the world in all different kinds of places, even in places we wouldn't expect it, uh, we're starting to see alternative means of social organization emerge that reject this kind of overarching authoritarian system that we associate with the state. Uh, you know, obviously there's, uh, there's Lieberland, there's uh, the Pirate Party, there's you know, all of these different uh, methods that people are using to subvert states all over the world. And, and a lot of things have emerged in places you'd never expect it. How many of you are familiar with the uh, Kurdistan independence movement? Right. There's a group in uh, Kurdistan um, that is an anarchist group that's actually influenced by an American anarchist named Murray Bookchin. I actually met him once many years ago. He's deceased now. Uh, but there's a, what actually happened was in, in Kurdistan you had a group, um, you had a Marxist political party that largely through the influence of their leader underwent a mass conversion to anarchism, uh, largely because this leader had become infatuated with the works of Murray Bookchin. And these folks are actually out there fighting a civil war with ISIS right now, and they're, and they're winning. Uh, if you do a Google search, just uh, search anarchist versus ISIS, and you can read about what's going on with these people. Uh, you know, a few years ago, somebody told me, well, where do you think the next anarchist revolution is going to be? It'll be in Kurdistan. I was said, oh, bullshit. That's the last place it's ever going to be. But it, but it happened. Resistance comes in a lot of uh, unusual places. Uh, it's also important to try to connect with people in all sorts of other movements, all sorts of subcultures, all sorts of countercultures who are in some way uh, resisting established authority for whatever reason. People have all sorts of reasons that motivate them to want to resist the system, to resist the state. Um, you know, I, I speak, I mentioned earlier, I speak to right wing, far right wing groups a lot. Yeah, but at some, at times, you know, I'll try to plant some seeds. I'll say, uh, you know, um, wouldn't it be nice if we just dissolve the state and maybe into some independent municipalities and everybody just goes their own way and does their own thing? And, and you'll get people thinking, yeah, that might not be too bad. You know, see, if you can turn fascist into anarchist, you're, you're, you're really rolling, all right? All right. Who here is an ex-Republican? Is anybody an ex-Republican? Anyone an ex-Democrat? All right. Anyone used to be a Marxist-Leninist? No ex-Commies here? You, you were a Marxist-Leninist? All right. Uh, what, is anyone an ex-fascist? Do uh, you want to admit? All right. All right. Was anybody uh, ever an adherent of some kind of theocracy? All right. All right. See, so you all woke up, right? I've never been anything but an anarchist, as long as I've been thinking about politics for like you know, 30 years, 35 years. Well, the way that that happened was I was, became very interested in all the different political philosophies, uh, you know, in different, you know, when I, when I was young, you know, in my teens, early 20s. I became interested in all the different beliefs people have about things, all the different religions and philosophical systems, you know, what is existentialism and all the political philosophies. And I looked at all these different political philosophies, including some fairly obscure ones, and I thought, well, none of these people really seem fit to me to rule society. 
And that included the anarchists, by the way. Yeah. So I thought, well, I guess I'm kind of with these anarchist people, only I'm more anarchist than they are. Yeah. But uh, so that's how all that started, and that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years or so. Um, but another thing, though, that I think is extremely important when it comes to building resistance to the state, to authoritarian institutions, is communication. And fortunately, we've got excellent tools for that now that are historically unprecedented. Um, I sure do wish I had had the internet available to me when I first became interested in anarchism 30 years ago. Um, I know that I've been able to connect with so many people through the internet that I never would, and, and, and reach an audience through the internet that I never would have been able to do. I remember in North America when the anarchist movement was four magazines that came out about twice a year each. Uh, and if you wanted to communicate with some other anarchist in some far away town, uh, you know, I used to write letters to anarchists all over the United States. And you know, you know how snail mail used to work. You, uh, you have to mail your letter and wait three weeks to get your response or whatever. It's really, really hard to build a movement like that. It's really difficult. Uh, and, you know, and I remember trying to hold public meetings, and of course, you know, there's no way of advertising on Facebook or Twitter or anything, so you have all your tacky hand letter, uh, hand builds, and you try to staple the staple gun and put them up on uh, telephone poles and that kind of thing. I've done all of that at various points. Uh, but now we have some really fantastic tools for communication. I mean, uh, the stuff that Jeff Berwick does, I mean, the fact that Jeff has really got his own media empire, his own anarchist media empire with this NRCast and all of the other things that he's doing. And there's so many other people that are doing this. You know, the, the, these, these tools, these technologies give uh, give us all a means of resisting on so many different fronts, and uh, you know, it's, and, and we can fight everywhere. You know, everyone should do what's best for them in terms of what they are able to do. You know, I do writing, I do public speaking. Uh, you know, I, I do interviews in the international media a lot. For some reason, Iranian media is always wanting to talk to me about something. Usually, U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but we have all these methods now of getting the word out and building resistance and, and throwing these ideas out for people to absorb. And I think that that's really what it's going to take. I think over the course of the next century or so, we're going to see more and more people become absorbed with the kinds of ideas like we've been talking about in this room over the past few days. And when these kinds of ideas become to come to take root in the culture, then the culture is going to change, and people's ways of thinking are going to change, and institutions are going to start to change. Uh, the, the, they used to have the saying during the Vietnam War, uh, in the anti-war movement, well, what if they called the war and just nobody showed up? All right, well, what if we held an election? What about in the presidential election this year in the United States if we, just nobody showed up? You know, one per, maybe 1% one showed up. Huh? Yeah. All right, Right? And that's all it really takes. It's really, it really just takes for us to be able to withdraw our consent in that way. If, we, if nobody shows up for a presidential election, nobody shows up for a war, then the state is finished. And if we say we're just going to go off and do our own thing and, and live our own lives the way we want, however that's going to be. I think a, a post-state world would be extremely diverse. It would be extremely pluralistic. Uh, you'd have maybe all kinds of regions and communities and towns and cities and neighborhoods and communes or whatever, micro-nations or intentional nations or whatever they are, crypto-nations, uh, organizing themselves in all kinds of ways, and, and, you know, some, of, some of which I might personally like and other things I might not like, and that's you know, too bad for me. Right? Freedom of association, voluntarism, all of that. Uh, and that's really the vision that we have for the future, or should have for the future, I think. And I think we're going to get pretty close to this in the 21st century, uh, because the religion of the state is breaking down just like the old theocratic religions that broke down in the 18th century. So we're, we're a lot closer than we think. Are you with me? By the 21st century, the statists had taken over the world. After 9-11, the savage union of the war on terror and the war on drugs squelched the last flickers of freedom. Central banking-backed wars raged. Violence, imprisonment and theft had become the norm. Not many could see any other way. Hope vanished. But then, 
when things looked their darkest, something happened. A surprise, and just in time. From the valleys, fjords, and suburbs rose the anarchists. From the cities, factories, and the dark web came the anarcho-capitalists. And from every other nook, corner, cranny, and drum circle, the voluntarists. Some said it was too little, too late. The war had already been lost. You can't change the system, they cried. And the anarchist answered, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. One rule to heal the world, one rule that binds them, one rule sets their moral compass and aligns them. The N A Mother Bucking P. And with that, they gather again, as they do every year, in Acapulco, Mexico, this coming February, for the third annual Anacapulco. Speakers include Locke and Rose, Jeffrey Tucker, Jeff Berwick, Adam Kokesh, Lauren Southern, Luke Radowski, Julia Toriansky, Roger Ver, Rick Falkfinger, Dana Martin, Judd Weiss, Max Egan, Josie Wales, That Guy T, Anarchy Girl, Sasha Daygame, Mark Victor, Trace Mayer, Ian Freeman and Mark Edge, Rosalind Ross, Tim Moen, Dan Dix, Dale Brown, Christopher David, Stephanie Murphy, Derek J. Freeman, Derek Bros, and many, many more. The headline musical act will be Eric July and Backwards. In and around the event will also be the Dola Vigilantes Internationalization and Investment Summit, Change Media University, plus Terry Brock's Fund Your Freedom Entrepreneurial Course, Adam Kokesh's Homesteading Workshop, Sasha Daygame's Anarchy in Relationships Course, Dana Martin's Free Your Family Workshop, and much, much more. And it will all be held the last week of February 2017 in Acapulco, Mexico at the five-star Mundo Imperial Resort and Convention Center. Go to anacapulco.com to stake your place in history. The world might just never be the same. Evacuate the state. Brave the future. <laughs>